and welcome back to another episode of the Cool Your Jets podcast. I'm your host, Ben Blessington, with Michael Nania. We have a very special episode. Mike DeVito, who was on our podcast two weeks ago, he was so good that we decided we needed to have him back. Uh, we're going to do a little film review session, taking a page out of, out of Joe Blewett's playbook here. We're going to watch some of the Jets defensive line um, plays from this year, some good plays, some bad plays, specifically about Quinn and Williams. Then we'll look at some of the Jets offensive line struggles from this year, some of the guys they brought in. Uh, then we'll look at towards the drafts, and then we'll probably close uh, looking at uh, some Mike DeVito highlights from his career, get some inside analysis on those plays. But first, Mike, how you doing, man? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me back on. I appreciate it. How you guys holding up? We're doing well. I don't know if the viewers can see this, but I can see that you do have the number 70 Mike DeVito jersey hanging uh, from the wall there. Um, oh, I love it, brother. I come great. into my office every day and look at that jersey and think, man, I wish I could go back to those times. We had, I will some fun. we had some fun out there in New York those years, right, guys? Oh, I yeah. mean, you were definitely there for the, for the best years to be a Jet, I guess, and certainly for the last two decades. I will say, you mentioned how Tim Tebow uh, was one of your closest friends. He, he went and roasted the Jets during an Easter Sunday <laughs> sermon. What was that about? Uh, did he really? See, I didn't yeah. see it. Um, he, he, said, he said the Jets traded for me, and then he, said so, and then he was like, uh, when was the last time a trade worked out for the Jets anyways? And I was just, oh, <laughs> a cheap shot. That's great. Yeah, uh, I think if you look at Tebow's year in New York, I, I would imagine he's probably a little salty. I think I'd be a little salty. I don't. I don't blame him at all. Specifically that that Cardinals game. When, uh, yeah, it was. It was that was definitely the, the low point, I guess, of the Jets yeah, that's, that year. That's right. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and start with um, with Quinn and Williams, as we talked about. He was the third overall pick in the draft, and a lot of Jets fans were pretty upset when they took him just because the amount of defensive linemen that the Jets have taken in the last 10 years. And when then you look at the offensive production for the team in the last 10 years, it's frustrating. You know, Quinn was known as by a lot of people, the best player in the draft and the former GM was very set on just taking the best player available every year. And Quinn, you know, was kind of just held to a very high standard for those reasons by Jets fans. And he kind of had an up and down year. He didn't, you know, maybe have the, the heights that a guy like uh, Josh Allen, who was an edge player that many Jets fans wanted, had. He, he didn't have the sacks or the numbers that backed it up, but he did have some good moments on film. And maybe you can speak to a little bit about the learning curve that it takes for, for a, a rookie defensive lineman. coming. I mean, he came from Alabama, and he came in as a very highly touted prospect, but clearly you could see from week one that he did struggle a little bit adapting to, to the NFL life. How, how hard is that transition, would you say, coming from specifically for the defensive lineman because it's hard for every position but for a guy like Quinn and how hard is that transition yeah it's incredibly difficult and, I, and you know there there's a part of me that feels bad for <laughs> these first round draft picks obviously uh, I wish I had their paycheck um, <laughs> but you know in order for these guys to break even they got to make the pro ball be all pros uh, especially if you're in that top 10 right I mean they're <laughs> you're really expected to come in and be a all pro player right away. And I remember when I was in Kansas city, Eric Fisher got drafted, the left tackle got drafted uh, first picked overall. And I remember how frustrating that was for him because he's trying to get used to it, trying to get adjusted to the NFL. And I don't care where you're coming from, Alabama, uh, LSU, wherever, it's still a big jump from college to the NFL. And there is certainly a learning curve. And so I always feel bad for those guys. And I had to tell them, look, you just, keep, you just keep grinding. I mean, one of the reasons they pick these guys is because of the intangibles that they have and because of, you know, the, the talent that they see. But uh, I think that there are times when it just takes a year or two to learn how to apply those things at an NFL speed on an NFL field. I mean, I know I was able to get in for 100 and something reps my rookie year. And, uh, boy, it was a shock to see even the difference between, an, you know, a regular season game compared to training camp or preseason. Um, and so, yeah, so obviously a number three pick, he's going to have a high standard, but I think Jets fans over the course of the next few years are really going to come to like when, you know, and I know they do, but I'm saying I, I expect him because he has all the traits, he has everything you could, you could want a defensive lineman. I expect him to live up to that number three pick. Um, and I think he did a good job last year from, from the, the sum that I saw him. I mean, he looks like, you know, he looks like an NFL lineman. Yeah, and this play is actually one of those plays where you can see uh, the potential that he has. He goes up against Lane Johnson here, the right tackle for the Eagles, who's one of the best in the league, and gets some penetration and sheds for the stuff. So uh, on that play, I, I think one of the most interesting things on this play is that, you know, as a defensive tackle, most of the time you're going up against the center, the guard, but here Quinnen is outside, and he takes on the tackle. So 
from your experience playing inside like Quinn and mostly did throughout his rookie season, what are some of the biggest differences between when you're going up against a tackle compared to the guys in the interior? Yeah, I actually like going against tackles better, and you can see it here a little bit more. They're, they're, they're taller guys. They have a tendency to stand up a little bit higher, generally speaking. And so it's a little bit easier to get underneath them where, you know, a lot of the inside guys, especially centers, are a little bit lower, a little bit more bowling ball type body frames. Uh, and so sometimes it's hard to get underneath. But you, you see Quinton does a great job getting his hands inside, separating, and then recognizing that he has that gap right? And making sure he has enough separation and getting off the block and making the play. And the one thing, if you pause it right here at the beginning of the play, I'm not sure if you go all the way back to the beginning so we can see that. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what the defense was called, but one thing I like about where he is, is you can tell he can, he recognizes the formation. So this play ends up hitting right where he is, but he gets wide because he sees he has, what is, is that a tap? Is that three tackles, two tackles? I think he has an overload or a big tight end there to his side. So he recognizes. Yeah, it looks like they formation. have two tight ends on that. Yeah, one tackle and a tight end on that side. Yeah, so he's got he's got a heavy formation, right? I think that's an extra tackle that came in plus a tight end. And so you're thinking, okay, runs this way. So it looked like he widened out, uh, which is really smart, especially if you're a young guy. It means he's looking at formations, which was the hardest thing for me to do. That was one of my hardest transitions was learning how to, to – uh, adjust my stance, adjust my technique, adjust my position based off what I'm seeing from an offense, right? Because in college, you can just line up, get over football, and, and normally, especially guys like this, are just killing the guys in front of them. Uh, in the NFL, obviously, that's not the case. And so I, I, right here, the, the thing I recognize before anything gets going is his recognition to widen out a little bit, uh, knowing that the chances are the ball's coming to that heavy formation. Yeah, and for a position that he plays, you know, this uh, defensive tackle, defensive end, he plays a lot of three tech, and, and we'll watch this. This is a this is actually a pretty great. Um, this is probably his best play of the year, in my opinion. This was a fourth and two, you know, big game. The Jets are zero and four playing Dallas. They were driving, and Dallas runs a a QB blast here with with Dak Prescott to the left side, and he completely blows this up. And just it, it happens to be that the Jets get the stop, and then the next play of the game was a ninety two yard touchdown to Robbie Anderson. So it really changed the game for the Jets. Um, but, you know, for a defensive tackle or a one-tech or a three-tech, I think part of the frustration in drafting a guy like that that high is a lot, of, a lot of his production might be hit in production. You saw in that last play that that's a great play for him, as you said, like his ability to just recognize uh, the formation that he's going up against and to cover that gap and take down Miles Sanders there. But, you know, a guy like Josh Allen, if they were to draft at an edge there, you know, he's probably accumulating eight to ten sacks a year, whereas Quinnen might not be doing that. Can you kind of speak to that? I mean, the, the hidden production of an interior defensive lineman and how important it is for a defense? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's massive. And you can see it on, on, again, these two plays that you've shown. And as, so, you know, somebody watching on film or somebody watching on, you know, on TV or at the stadium, it's going to be hard to see these things. It's hard to see the interior. So uh, you're right. He, he's not always going to get it. Trust me, I know. He's not going to get the recognition that he deserves. <laughs> uh, but this is a uh, – this is a big play. And another thing you see in both of these plays is his get off. I mean, he's, he's getting off the football. He's staying low here. He doesn't let the tackle cut him out. He's able to stay in his gap, gap recognition, staying in there. Uh, and then he bends down the line, right? I know a lot of guys that uh, at that point would, would make their way upfield too much uh, instead of bending down the line. So he's able to bend down the line, get flat and make that tackle in the backfield. Uh, that's a fantastic play. I mean, it's, textbook and again something that I would not have been able to accomplish my first year in the NFL I mean this is just a this is a great play great get off great block recognition good job staying square getting flat down the line um, so I mean yeah you can see it again right away that he has all the traits you want in a big you know three tech nose tackle type player yeah as we're just kind of showing some some of uh, some of his other plays something that I've seen and maybe you can speak to this on Twitter that that I mean look Jets fans are a very passionate bunch, but something that, that people are getting on Quinn about is his lack of, I guess I should say muscle definition. You know, he kind of has a bit of a, a dad bod as, as some people are, are accusing him of. And people are saying, you know, that that just points to, you know, maybe he needs to get in the gym more. And, you know, you see guys like Aaron Donald who just looks like an absolute freak. Yeah. Can you speak to, is that important at all? Do you think that, you know, a, even a guy like who's built like Quinn and who does have, doesn't have as much definition or tricep definition or whatever, but he does have a lot of natural strength, as you can see through some of these plays. Can you kind of downplay or, or just speak to maybe it is important, the, I guess, the, 
the weight room side of the NFL and how important, I guess, muscle definition or anything is for, for defensive linemen? Yeah, so the most important thing is, ex- is explosiveness. Uh, you know, it doesn't so much matter, you know, muscle definition doesn't matter, but even, you know, your ability to lift heavy weights, uh, uh, you know, and do all those things that maybe people would think you'd do, a, you know, big guys do in the weight room. What, what matters most is your ab- ability to get going, to get be explosive with the weight that you have. And you can see he stays low and he's explosive. And so, uh, you know, the, the weight room and that kind of stuff, I think it's obviously very important. Uh, and it, it was able to keep me in the NFL. Uh, but I, if you <laughs> look at me and my pads, I'm not one to criticize anybody else. Uh, for what they look like, because uh, you want to see a dad bod, just go and look at what, what I look <laughs> like playing nose tackle at 320 with my stomach hanging out. And I remember my dad used to call me after the game, and I one time he told me, he said, you know, your helmet, your head is so fat, and your helmet is so tight, and it looks like your head is just going to pop in that thing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so again, uh, and looks can be deceiving. I bet you, you put him in the weight room. I bet you he's throwing around a lot of weight. I mean, because he's throwing around these guys pretty well. So, uh, yeah, so I'm not, you know, I think he passes the look test. I mean, he's tall. Uh, he's got long arms. He's explosive. Um, so everything I'm seeing on here makes me think he, he does, does well in the weight room as well. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, you can see, I mean, if he wasn't strong, he would not be getting this kind of knockback, this kind of penetration. Um, so, yeah, so no, I, and, and obviously I've seen him on film as well, uh, you know, on the regular TV cutups, and he, he looks the part. I mean, I think he looks the part. And there's this one play that I feel like uh, it's not one of the splashier plays. It wasn't a clutch play or anything, but then if you can go to 15 seconds, the third play, this one against the Cowboys. Um, he's going up against two all pros here and Zach Martin uh, and Travis Frederick of Dallas. And he's just able to shed that double team and cut back to the ball and get in on this stuff. So I think this is a really impressive play. So what can you say about, because this is an outside zone run that they're going against here. How tough is it for him to do what he does, shedding that double team, then coming back uh, to the backside and get in on that tackle? Yeah. Let me just see it one more time. I mean, I, I think it, I think the back sees that he's got penetration and that's why he cuts it upfield. Um, and so you can see, I mean, he, you know, he gets a little bit, he gets cut off a little bit by uh, the center, but he's knocking them back, right? I mean, he's got those guys going backwards and that forces the back to cut upfield. Uh, and so when you're doing that from a, you know, a one technique, uh, when you're stopping it, what looks like, what looks to be a, a, some sort of outside zone, or setting up to be an outside zone, uh, that's a that's a productive play. I mean, you can see, look, he's shedding guys. Yeah, you're right. You got two all pros on you right there, and that they're not moving you anywhere, right? I mean, he's knocking you back, and then he's able to fall back into that backside B gap and make the tackle. I mean, that's that's pretty damn good. Yeah, like this is a play that doesn't get a ton of recognition, and it's still you know a stuff on first down, which is really valuable, but right. because of the stage or anything. But when you see what he's doing against two really good players, uh, this is just one of my favorite plays from him. And also, he's on the front side there where he lines up and then comes all the way back to the back side. But uh, we do have a couple of other plays here because you know he is so good in the run game, but it's really in the passing game. Uh, where he wasn't as productive as we expected. So, obviously, this is a great rep right here. causes an interception. But we got a couple reps here where he didn't do so much. So, on this play, he lines up outside and isn't really able to do all that much. Let me see this that one more time. Yeah, that Redskins one yeah. was interesting. So, it looks like he kind of tried an inside I will say, move. I, I will say, I believe yeah. Dwayne Haskins makes, like, an incredible yeah, throw. Yeah, he actually he makes – he completed this throw. I cut it off, but – uh, so Quinnen though doesn't really create a ton of pressure here. So <laughs> I'm wondering uh, though if that's a did the corner blitz? Yeah, he did on the outside. That's so they like might less have, Austin. Yeah, because look at the end and the the end and the uh, three technique both both jam inside. So I imagine he has to do that. It looks like that's a design. Like they like that's part of the call. So like uh, he so yeah. wants to just carry them inside, kind of create that opportunity for the corner outside. Yeah, so they're blitzing the corner off the edge. So they're saying you guys get inside now. So That's I'll run, I'll just have some of these plays playing, and then you could tell me if you'd want to stop them. But I guess how much how much is that? Because a lot of Jets fans will see that and see like Quentin Williams loses this play or whatever. But how much do you think Greg Williams tasks him with 
holding a gap. You know, this play might be more of a rush that he just can't get. But you, you spoke to that Redskins play, and a lot of Jets fans would look at that and say that he fails in this play. But as you point out, yeah, if it's a corner blitz and, and he has to stunt inside, I mean, he doesn't have much of a choice. So how much, I guess, would you say of Quinn and Williams' struggles could be attributed to just his role of, of filling gaps? Yeah, look at I me. Mean, look at this one against the Raiders right here. Um, and so you say, okay, yeah, I mean, he didn't get much penetration. So this is definitely a call. I, I, he probably got in trouble for rolling back out of the A gap. But this one right here. Now look, right, stop right there. Look at the other three guys. Right? Everybody has a one-on-one. Right? So you send big 9-5 down from a, from a three technique into the A gap. He's going to take up both the center and the guard. And now everybody else has a one-on-one. Um, and so this is – Based on the protections, you you know you would have guys do do this kind of stuff, right? So you'd stunt down and say, okay, uh, if you're away from the back, you're probably going to get the slide uh, from the center. So you stunt down into the A gap and take up both the guard and the center because the center is going to be sliding towards you, and that'll leave everybody else with a one on one. And it looks like that's what was created here. I mean, uh, the center has to take 95 incognitos on 95, and so everybody else. Had, you know, at the end of the play is one-on-one with their guy. So yeah. I guess That's the question – like one of the off-the-stat sheet kind of things that he brings to the table, and it's definitely – like you can make the argument that at the third pick you hope for more, but I feel like this is what he was really doing a lot of this season because, as you said, even though he's not doing anything, he is creating the opportunity for other people, for other players on the defense to have, you know, higher percentage chances to go one-on-one for – whether it's a blitzer off the edge, just have more space. And there's just so many ways he makes that impact. And just really in general, so many defensive tackles help the team in that way, and it doesn't get a ton of recognition. Yeah, I guess – sorry, not, not to cut you off, but I guess the, the question that arose when you, bring, when you bring up this Raiders play where he's, where he's filling the gap, I mean, could Quinn Williams be better suited as, as a very talented, you know, prospect coming out doing more than filling gaps I think that's maybe the thing that the that Jets fans get frustrated about is why take a guy at three if you're going to have a lot of his role be you know take eating up double teams because it's not like the Jets have elite pass rushers Henry right. Anderson and Terrell Basham and I believe that's Kyle Phillips are good players but you know there's no Khalil Max, there's no Yanni Ngakwe's or anybody else it seems like Quinnen should be one of those guys on the end on those one-on-ones can you kind of speak to that I guess is, is yeah but I think that's a great point. And I think if, so if this was, you know, if this was say me and uh, Sean Ellis in here or me and uh, you know, maybe Tom Bahali or one of those guys, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I'm the guy that's stunning inside uh, so that he can get the, you know, so the, the, the better pass rusher can get the one-on-one. Um, and so, yeah, so I don't know. See, this is a little bit weird because normally you would think, that the center would set to 96. So maybe that's what they thought, right? Because the back is away from 96. And so normally the, the slide is away from the back. And here they slid to the back. And so I don't know if the Jets knew that, but maybe Quinton thought he was going to have the one-on-one and was going to take the inside rush on Incognito, which is actually smart, uh, given that he was to the back. And 96 was, I believe, in a one t- – or is in a two-eye, right? I mean, he's down – yeah. Or two so right straight here, up, really. Yeah, so right here, if I'm, if I'm rushing the passer, or if I'm trying to coordinate the inside, you know, pass rush, I'm thinking, okay, Hudson's going to set to his right, right, to the, to the defensive left because he's away – because the back's to the opposite side. And he has a one technique in his gap. Uh, so I would have – they might have set this up thinking, okay, you know, you take the – now you have the one-on-one point because you're to the back. And the best way to rush incognito is his inside. He always struggled with inside rush. Um, and then they just, you know, they changed it up and actually had Rodney come back to help incognito. So this actually might have been set up to give him the one-on-one and it just didn't play out like that. That's, that's some really interesting stuff. And, and this next, we have these next uh, play that it'll run that actually worked out for the Jets in their favor. And this kind of speaks to kind of what you we were talking about earlier, the adjustment um, that you have to make from college to the NFL. Because this was Quentin Williams' first game in the NFL – and he, yeah, he struggled in this game. He did, certainly had more of those hidden production plays as the season went on. Of course, the Jets score a touchdown. But a guy that we wanted to talk to about is this guy, Big 99, Steve McClendon right here, who yeah. I guess would be the king of hidden production for the Jets. Gets no props, and, and we'll go back to some of these plays, but I just want to show you some of them. He doesn't get much props, I, I guess, from Jets fans because he's, you know, to tackle. We've, been a, we've had some bad teams or whatever. 
but he's a guy who has really produced for the Jets at that nose tackle position pretty much year in and year out. Uh, and the analytics can back it up when he's not in the field that the Jets are a significantly worse team, uh, specifically uh, against the run. Go to that first. Yeah, right here. This is fantastic. So what I love about this play is, and you can tell this is a vet, or this is a this is a veteran defensive lineman right here. Oh yeah, he, he is. knows that that center is trying to get up to that linebacker at a fifty-eight. So it would be easy for him to just hit this gap, right? Just swim that guy, hit the gap, penetrate, try to make the tackle in the backfield. He instead makes sure that he keeps his hands on that center and doesn't allow him to jump through and get the get the linebacker. And so now you have a two for one, right? And that linebacker's free, and he's able to come around the linebacker who makes penetration and make the play. So not only is he athletic and, and able to recognize and get around that penetrating linebacker, but he does a great job. I mean, you can tell he's a selfless player because I know a lot of guys would just try to hit that gap and go, and he makes sure to to you know, get his hands on the center and not allow him up to the backer so that 5'8 can fly through and make the play. And, and he also got called for, uh, I think, the right guard. Yeah, the right guard got called for a hold on him, too, on that play. So uh, he was able to make the stuff and the penalty. And he is a veteran. He's the longest tenured player on the team, and he just makes so many plays like that. Ben, if you can go to the, the, the play against Buffalo, uh, the, not the next one, but the one after that. Uh, we'll just yeah, let it run. I mean, this one was, <laughs> this one was just absurd. But this one, too. Uh, he like dominates the right tackle here. Uh, then that creates the stuff just by not letting him get to the second level. So yeah. uh, just he's another play here where he makes that impact. Yeah. Look, I mean, he's got, he's he, uh, three guys have touched three blockers have touched him in this play and he's five yards in the backfield. But, I mean, look at this, right? So they're going to, they're trying to do some kind of double team. Uh, he tosses the tackle down the guard <laughs> has to come off. And now is that the backside that's the backside lineman, or is that the uh, Yeah, I think it's the left guard coming. Yeah, yeah look, the many, th- th- three linemen have had to account for him so far. So if three linemen have tried to block you during a play, uh, you're, in good, you're in good shape, because that means there's, about, there's three other guys that are free to make the tackle, and that's where you can see, 58, there's nobody for him. Right. Um, so, yeah, so you can tell he's a, he's a selfless player, and he's, he's uh, aggressive. I mean, you see he keeps going. He never stops. Yeah, he's definitely a player that, that I'm excited – that is in the locker room with a guy like Quentin Williams because you can teach him a lot of these things because, you know, when Steve McClendon is not on the field for rundowns, it really shows. And the Jets haven't been good at many things the past few years, but their run defense has pretty consistently been up there. And Steve McClendon is a big reason why. And I think some people were surprised when he was signed to an extension in the middle of last year because, you know, he's a 32-year-old. You know, people are thinking, oh, the Jets are trying to get younger. But you see with some of these plays right here as to why the Jets would want to bring him back. It doesn't matter how old he is. Because he's eating up these blocks, he's so selfless and he's smart. Um, just, yeah, a really talented player. This last play for the Jets' offensive line before we move ahead to, to some different stuff. Uh, this is a combination, I guess. We have this – this is a new – I shouldn't say new. He's now going to be a third-year defensive tackle. Bolorenzo Fadukasu, who really came out of his shell last year. Had a really great season. I believe Quentin Williams is also involved in this play right and here. He's on the right side. He's the uh, three technique on the right. Right. And and Full Lorenzo and Quentin just completely yeah. blow up this run. I'll go back. As, as yeah, that play. was fantastic. I mean, again, and now this is not a slouch offensive line either. I mean, this is one of right. your this is one of your top offensive lines in the NFL. But these, they're doing a great job teaching get off and and uh, uh, pad level uh, in New York. I mean, these guys are getting off the football, staying low and knocking guys back. I mean, when you split a double team like that, that's a beautiful feeling. Uh, and, and we've seen it – we really – not to cut you off, sorry, but no, we've no, seen no. a few We've seen a few plays now where these guys are uh, – whether it's been McClendon, Q, and now Foley Fadakasi here, who's kind of like a young McClendon. But uh, we've seen a few plays here where they're, they've been really beating double teams well. So uh, what is your approach like in terms of double teams? How do you anticipate that one is going to be coming? And then when one does, how do you go about – uh, beating those yeah I mean it's a lot of it has to it has to go into your uh, film film work and preparation you know studying your opponents because uh, a lot of times down in distance personnel um, uh, things like that can can give away a ton as far as formation recognition uh, can give away a ton of what you're going to get but what these guys are doing I mean they're just getting off the football uh, these guys are getting off the football. and you see look 70 and 75 are knocked back and this double team is knocked back in this sort of in this 46 front. I mean, there's this is a jailbreak right here. There's literally nowhere to go, and this is designed to hit right up the middle, uh, you know, behind their best guys. And there's nothing. Uh, so this is, you know, 
honestly, I would be surprised when you when you hear about the Jets over this last season. Uh, I I'm surprised to see these types of film, these types of plays showing up. This is this is an aggressive, tough front right here. I mean, if you you know you've got other teams seeing these guys knock back big seventy there. I mean, he's an all pro. Uh, you you see guys like that. That that's just chaos in the middle. I mean, that that defensive line is looking good. Oh, just wait. You'll see with the next few offensive line clips as to why the Jets were were uh, a laughing stock last year. But clearly, <laughs> Greg Williams did his job. I mean, the Jets did finish seven and nine with the thirty first or thirty second ranked offense, and that's because Greg Williams had his guy ready. Got had his guys ready to play each and every week. And he faced a ton of injuries. I mean, his next man up philosophy, I mean, really proved true for the Jets because when Darnold went down, Gase really struggled with that. His, the offensive side to the next man up didn't really work. But for, for Greg Williams, I mean, C.J. Mosley, their $18 million linebacker, goes down in week one. And the Jets do struggle at first. I mean, they didn't finish that game. But guys like Blake Cashman and Neville Hewitt, 46 right here, 58, James Burgess, those guys really stepped up. And you really have to attribute that to Greg Williams' coaching. I guess in your playing days, I mean, how much did Rex Ryan, you know, preach that next man up philosophy? Or when you're in KC, how important is that to a football team? Because as you know, I mean, your, your team in, in December is very different than your team in, in September. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's huge. I mean, and, you know, you're, you're trying to build a roster where that's the case, right? I mean, that's why you're always trying to have competition, right? Going into the training camp and all that. You want competition because you want – there, to, you know, you want your ones and twos to be to be close in talent, uh, in and ability, uh, for that reason, so especially on the defensive line, because you not only you know do you get, get guys hurt, but you're going to be rotating guys in and out. You don't want there to be a drop off. Uh, but one thing you can I can tell again across the board, like you guys are saying, even with the linebackers, this is a Greg Williams defense. I mean, the next guys up, the one thing they everybody is on board with and in tune with is this violent philosophy. I mean, this is a violent defense. Uh, and so Rex used to always tell us, you know, we're going to build a bully, right? We, wanna, we want a defense that when guys turn on the film, when, when opposing teams turn on the film, they're like, damn, we got to play these guys. You know, and that's what I'm seeing right here from the Jets. I mean, this is a bully defense. These guys are getting off the football and playing violent. And it, so whether it's your starters or your backups, everybody's bought into the fact that we are going to get off the football and we're going to get after guys. So now you're going to see some of the negatives for the Jets. And a big issue for them was, I mean, the offensive line. And, and you, you hear the term, you know, it, the game is won in the trenches. And the Jets, you've clearly seen they've done half of that. Their defensive line is, is very good. And, and the Jets are good at defensive lines with guys like Leonard Williams, Muhammad Wilkerson, and Sheldon Richardson. The different part about this defense is it didn't have many big names. I guess Quinton Williams was a top pick. But Fuller runs off Fadukasi, Nathan Shepard, Steve McClendon. These are guys who were kind of just completely flown under the radar by – the NFL and even Jets fans, and they still showed up. But the Jets' offensive line was a completely different story. I have two plays here, and I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, on what exactly happened. Big number 71, that's Alex Lewis, who had a pretty solid year. Joe Douglas traded for him in August uh, from the Ravens, and he, he played uh, the majority of the games for the Jets at guard. And he was brought back this, uh, this offseason on a three-year deal. So he's going to be the starter this year. He could be a backup. But this is not one of his better plays. Can you kind of give us some insight into what exactly happens on this play? Because this Jacksonville game – I think Sam Donald got sacked at least like seven times. Is, is Alex Lewis expecting – I should go back a little bit further. Is Alex Lewis ex, What is Alex Lewis expecting here? Because he really doesn't fully commit to 94. He completely turns to Calais Campbell. But as you can see, they have Ryan Griffin and Chuma Adoga double-teamed on Calais Campbell. And then Ryan Khalil seems to expect that 94 is going to, to Alex Lewis. So is this just a miscommunication on the offensive line's part? Is this on Sam Donald's part? Uh, can you kind of just speak to, as a guy who played in the trenches – what might have happened on this play? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I, I'm not, <laughs> the, I, I'm not the, the best when it comes to uh, recognizing what, uh, you know, what offenses are doing in pass protection, um, but at least from an offensive line perspective. But I, what I do see is I'm not quite sure why 55 slides, you know, is slides to the right. I mean, I guess maybe he thinks – you know, they have that little stunt going on. But, again, normally the back is that way. You would think he would stay on 94. So I'm not sure if that's 71's fall. I, I feel like 55 should be paying more attention to 94. And I think that was somewhat what was so frustrating because 55 is Ryan Khalil, who's an yeah. NFL vet, a really good uh, offensive uh, player for, for a decade in the NFL. But the Jets just seem to have so many mental errors on the offensive line. And and Khalil, you would think, would, would – solve some of that but he 
you know, on film showed it to be kind of an issue uh, for him this season. Yeah, and I mean, it's not even like 94. I mean, 94 starts to play straight up the field. So maybe this is a, maybe this is a, 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 you know, a play recognition here. So maybe he's thinking there's a blitz or some kind of simulated pressure coming from the right. And so he feels like he has to get out there because it does look like that end is jamming down. Uh, but 94 just straight up the field, you know, in that, uh, in that A gap. And so even if 71 were to come down hard, which would be a weird, uh, which would be a weird protection, you know, he's still at addition advantage because 94, 94 is just straight, you know, straight going. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, again, all this with a grain of salt because offensive protections are incredibly complex. Uh, and, and I'm not going to be the first one to tell you, uh, you know, I'm not an expert when it comes to uh, what, what these guys are doing here. But, but from my, my layman's perspective, I guess, it, it would seem that 55 had the mental error there and that he should have stayed by 94 at least a little bit longer than that. I mean, they just, you know, that was the Red Sea part right there between 71. Now, again, you're right too, though. I mean, you've got two guys, you got a tight end and a tackle there for that outside end, for Campbell. And, you know, that, that's a pretty long step for him to come inside to the B gap. Uh, so they should be able to handle it with those two guys out there. So you'd think there'd be a double right there, a double with 55 and 71, and then 67 and 72 picking up that, uh, that game, but that's, yeah. I mean, if you're going to let anybody free, don't let the, the one technique free, you know, because that's, that's the closest guy to the football. And I think it speaks a lot to just how valuable communication is up yeah. front because, Ben, as you said, Khalil played in the NFL for a really long time and was really good for the Panthers throughout his tenure there, but he comes out of retirement, joins the Jets uh, late in the offseason, and the Jets really had a lot of communication issues while he was out there, so – um on the defensive side, because uh, like you said, you didn't play O-line, not exactly uh, something that you can uh, – really anyone who hasn't played O-line, it's just such a tough thing to comprehend. But on the defensive side, especially when you're running stunts, thing, uh, things like that, how important is it to know – because from a communication perspective, it's not like there's too much post-snap communicating going on. It's just more uh, having, having a feel and just the knowledge of what your teammates are going to do. So from your perspective on the defense, before we get into this – uh, another breakdown here from the Jets offensive line uh, on the defensive side when you're playing up front how important is it to have that feel uh, and just that knowledge uh, that experience playing with some uh, a few other guys like you also played with Sione Pouha a few different guys in that D-line how important is it to have that feel and communication uh, just experience together oh yeah I mean it's incredibly important uh, but even more so on offense right I mean some of the best offensive lines I've played against weren't necessarily you know, world beaters. They were just guys who were on the same page, right? When the second that unit uh, it splits a little bit, um, there's a problem. Uh, and so, you know, what I used, to, what we used to try to do all the time on defense was stem the front, right? So we would line guys up all over the place and move them around and try to get those guys one to either communicate so we could get their calls or to try to mess up, um, uh, mess up their uh, their co- you know, their, their cohesion, right? To get get people to make their mental errors. But the better these teams were at, at you know, the, the teams, that, the, the offensive linemen that had played, the offensive lines that had played together for longer periods of time that knew each other's, you know, uh, tendencies, knew what each guy was going to do, didn't have to talk about it. Those were the hardest offensive lines to go against. Um, and so, yeah, but communication is incredibly important, both on the offensive and defensive line, uh, but especially on the old line, because if everybody's not on the same page, you're, you're dead in the water. So this game against the Patriots, there were a ton of breakdowns. We're not going to go through all of them. Um, we've obviously talked about them ad nauseum on this podcast, but we did want to look at this one because this is a really interesting one. Uh, Darnold gets sacked here and fumbles. The Patriots recover it. Uh, but they get a guy unblocked off the edge here, and Darnold doesn't get the ball out. So we've kind of been debating who this is on. I think it's mostly on Darnold, but at the same time, it's not the best look uh, in terms of, the protection and him uh, having to deal with that pressure immediately. So we have both views here. We have all 22 so we could see the routes. And then here we have uh, the end zone view so we can kind of see in the trenches. So uh, from what you're seeing here, who do you think this is on? Because I really feel like the Jets did the best that they could with this and Darnold has to get it out pretty quickly. Uh, but what are you seeing here? Yeah, I mean, this is a good defensive call. Uh, you, you got, you know, you got uh, one more than they can block. What I'm curious about, if you go to the end zone, 
Um, we used to run a play similar to this uh, in Rex's defense where everybody was on everybody was on train tracks to the quarterback. And then certain guys, if they got blocked, they would drop into pass coverage, right? So you'd bring one more than they had protection. Um, and you would rush until you got blocked. And then if you got so blocked. So are those two guys 54 and 21, are they planning to drop back or are they making that I'm adjustment? I'm trying to figure out. I wonder if, no, I think, I don't think they were. I think they're on train tracks to the quarterback. And then the second they get blocked, they're dropping back out. They're saying, okay, we're not going to get there. But what that does is it forces the offensive line to block and you have one more guy coming than they can account for. And so you get the best of both worlds because you get the guys out in the coverage, uh, especially underneath coverage, uh, but you also get a guy free uh, because you're bringing more than they have to block. And so I would say this is probably on Darnold. I, I don't know how they would set this protection to help him. I mean, you see from the end zone copy again, they're setting the protection to the old, the defense's uh, right. So to our right side, because you have all those guys out there. Um, and so you got to block the close smiths. Everybody on the left does that. So I think that that's on Darnold to get rid of that. Yeah. And there's definitely, you had uh, Jameson Crowder in the slot on the left side was open to and there were a lot of other mistakes in this game that were largely not Darnold's fault but this one does seem like him it's always interesting to just look at how uh because when you see it live you just see you know defenders barreling in as soon as he takes the snap and it's so hard to really analyze what happened but then when you look back you can really see uh, just all the nuances that go into it but uh we look through a couple of Jets plays now we have some plays uh, from a few different draft prospects because the Jets are obviously going to be looking uh, to take away some of uh, the issues that they dealt with there. And, and they did sign a few additions as well. So before we get to the draft, uh, we have some of those guys. I actually, I actually forgot. I, I was prepared to call an audible. <laughs> yeah. You call me skipping them. I, I kind of put the pressure on you there. But this is uh, Josh Andrews who they signed from the Colts. And he only started one game or didn't start this game, but uh, he only played extended time in this one game. But he had some in- interesting plays I wanted to get your perspective on. So this one right here, uh, TJ Watt, who's, obviously one of the best players in the league up front. He comes barreling through, uh, and Andrews does a good job saving this play. He comes back. He's the center here, 63. Uh, yeah. So he comes back, and he shoves Watt out of the play. Uh, but at the same time, he does let Watt come through in the first place. So uh, what do you think about what Andrews does here? Should he have not taken as wide of a step uh, and done a better job blocking that in the first place? Yeah, I mean, again, it's hard to tell. It looks like he – it looks like – I mean, because this is an outside zone play, so it looks like he's trying to get it on his horses and go. Um, but I think, if you know, if he's scanning just before the snap, he can see that Watt is, you know, coming down and ready, you know, ready to, to fire in there. And so he's going to have to – he definitely has him on this play. But he does, a, he does a great job of redirecting, coming back, and preventing what it looks like to be, you know, really – you know, really nasty TFL there. So, yeah, that was certainly good. And one thing you're going to get from this guy is he's – talk about a good offensive line. The Colts uh, are about as good as they come. And so he's going to have that experience being around some of the best offensive linemen in the NFL for a year and learning from those guys. Uh, obviously, Quentin Nelson is, is going to be, you know, one of the best offensive linemen to ever play the game. Uh, so he'll come over with that knowledge, and they have an aggressiveness and a toughness. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, see, he – oh, okay, this is a different play. Oh, yeah, this is the next play. Uh, So on on this play, he does do a really good job in pass pro one-on-one. So I wanted to ask you about uh, when you're going one-on-one from the interior because uh, he's going up here against, uh, looks like the two eyes who was over the uh, left guard's inside shoulder, who was Quinn Nelson, actually. But when you're rushing from the inside, how do you kind of set that plan? Is How much of that is pregame, just kind of knowing your opponents, and how much of that are you doing on the fly in terms of, uh, what you're going into a rep with as a, in terms of your first move and your counter move on that overall rush. Because right here, Andrews completely dominates this rep. Yeah, this is really good. As, as a defensive lineman, the, the best that I've been around will watch tape on the guys they're going to go against and see what, what's caused the, you know, their opponent's trouble and then practice that and mimic that throughout the week you know, and during one-on-ones and team drills and things like that so that they're ready to, to use it on Sundays, right? And so – They'll, they'll, they'll cater their moves and they'll adjust their, their moves on Sundays to the moves that have, you know, given these guys trouble. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest things with pass rush is getting off the football, getting your head down and uh, being relentless, right? So you want to get off pad level and relentlessness uh, is important. 
um, as a defensive lineman. Yeah, but, but right here, I mean, this is a great job. He's got his hands inside. He's got good – you can tell he's got good balance, good feet. And then he snatches them right there at the end. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a good job. I mean, he's, he's, he's by himself, right? So a lot of offenses are set up, uh, especially in pass protection, to help your center, right? Because that's normally your lighter guy, somebody that you're worried about having one-on-one. And they, they leave him to do, you know, do his job, especially a younger guy like that, and uh, leave him on his own on an island inside. And he does a, he does a great job uh, finishing that rep all the way through. And, and I want to ask you here, because at the end of the play, 94, you know, he jumps up, tries to knock it down. But once you're, uh, from a defensive tackle perspective, once your rush is shut down, if it's been two, three seconds, you haven't got anywhere, you can see you're not going to get anywhere, like in this situation where Andrews has it, completely shut down what do you start to do once your initial rush is shut down do you just try to get your hands up in the passing lane uh what is just your overall reaction once your rush is shut down and you are still trying to make something happen yeah you, you keep trying to close the pocket but if i think you're right i think the best thing you can do is try to get those hands up and try to prevent him uh you know try to get a batted ball or at least take his vision off that one side um uh but yeah i mean so you're going to try to keep getting pushed, keep knocking your guy back, keep trying to close that, that pocket, and then get ready to get your hands up and knock that ball down. And then we do have a play here from Connor McGovern, who they signed at center, who is uh, probably going to be uh, – definitely is the most talented addition they made in free agency. But they had a big need at center. They have had a big need at center ever since Nick Mangold retired. And it seems like McGovern is going to help them figure that out. So kind of like this last play, just a really good – one-on-one rep here against the nose tackle. And this one's interesting because we don't really see nose tackles uh, really get to go one-on-one against the center too much. Usually it's just uh, – you just don't really get to see that too much. But here McGovern does go one-on-one uh, against uh, – the nose tackle is pretty much head up against him, and he takes it on pretty well. So uh, from you play a lot of nose tackle and on the inside. So uh, how hard is it to adjust from you know playing more dirty working roles to eventually taking on – uh, one-on-one against the center like this well yeah I mean so just speaking specifically for 60 right away I can tell uh, that he's a good lineman just by the fact that the Denver offense is okay leaving him one-on-one on Chris Jones right in the middle of the defense right I mean, who is Chris a beast Jones, yeah I mean he's the best in the NFL I mean he's just unstoppable and they're fine you know leaving 60 on an island with him which is just you know, it tells you that they have a ton of trust in the player that he is. Uh, and he does a great job. I mean, I've seen, you know, Chris Jones knock back Quentin Nelson into the into the quarterback slot. You know, I mean, this is a guy who plays low, who's got great leverage, uh, and can drive back basically anybody he wants to. And you see 60 here, again, by himself, gets his hands inside, drives his feet. And, I mean, look, you look where Chris is. Uh, there, you're not going to see too many plays with 95 getting pushed out of the pocket like that especially one-on-one with the center. So the, just based off of this rep alone, I mean, this, he, he looks legit. That's, that's a great play. Yeah, and he does do that a lot. The pass protection is uh, – the passing game is really where he does have the most value. And, and if you can go back to the beginning of that play, Ben, uh, I think it's interesting because most of the time – and this is what makes Jones really good, the fact that he can line up at that spot. Uh, you don't really see a ton of guys line up at the nose who can come in uh, with a, a rush move like that, he kind of gives him the outside step and tries to come back inside. Uh, McGovern does a really good job getting his hands on there. But as a rusher, what is important, because McGovern kind of wins this rep, he gets his hands inside, uh, really grabs Jones, doesn't let him go anywhere. How do you get an offensive lineman's hands off of you as a rusher? Yeah, I mean, you, the key is you got to fire off the football low, right? So now Chris gets a little high here and gives him his chest. You don't want to. You want to get up the football low, so he doesn't have a. You know he can't get his hands inside. Uh, but Rex Ryan used to call this board over rooster, right? So if you get a one on one on the center, uh, you you're just you know if this is me. I'm bringing it, right? You got normally you have a lighter guy uh, who's not used to handling big guys one on one. So if it's me, I'm not even dancing side to side. I am just taking it straight down the middle, uh, uh, driving him back, bull rushing him back, uh, and staying low. Um, so Chris tries to get that side to side move and stands up a little bit doing it and allows 60 to get his hands inside. Uh, I, especially at the beginning of the game, I think your best bet two or three times you get him head up like this, just bull rush, just run him over, get him thinking that you're going to bring it and then start working that side to side stuff. I don't know if that's what Chris ended up doing or he did prior to this. Uh, but I mean, 
outside of going against a tight end or a running back, uh, there's no better situation than, you know, a nose tackle uh, one-on-one on the center. Really interesting stuff, Mike. We'd like to talk about some draft prospects and, and we don't, we'll, we'll let some of these plays run and, and we'll go back and look, but we don't need to, uh, you know, analyze them as much just because there's a lot of j- draft prospects. It was a little easier when we had guys we know are going to be Jets. Um, so this is Tyler Biadish, who's, who's a uh, center guard for Wisconsin. He's, a, he's an option for the Jets, maybe in the third or fourth. Um, uh, then the next guy that'll pop up. Uh, but obviously he was, he was a three-year starter, I believe, and, and a team captain. Um, so he's a guy that we believe Joe Douglas could be interested in late day or day three. Um, this is Matt Hennessy, who is a tackle for Temple. He's probably a third rounder, maybe even a second rounder. Uh, and he fits Adam Gase's offense quite nicely, just given his athleticism, as you see. Which pick one's up this now, 74? Sorry, he's, sorry, he's 58. My, my apologies. Oh, okay. So, okay, so he's going to be looking at centers. Yeah, both these guys are centers. Well, because they brought in McGovern as the center, but the good thing about McGovern is, and this is something Joe Douglas spoke to a lot, is he wants versatility. So McGovern actually played right guard for for Denver. Maybe that's why he was more comfortable going on -on one-on-one against Chris Jones. Um, So they could potentially draft a guy like Beadish or just to be a backup or even a guy like Hennessy who'd probably be a starter uh, and then slide McGovern over. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I guess just to start here on the interior offensive line, if, if you're GM Mike DeVito, Mm-hmm. Um, let's say you go in a you know, front office or maybe you're a scout or whatever. What are some of the traits that you're looking for for an interior offensive lineman? As a guy who faced interior offensive linemen day in and day out, what are some of the most important traits for a guy like Hennessy or a guy like Beatish that we watch here? So I'm looking for the next Richie Incognito. I want the dirtiest, nastiest, meanest guy on the off, you know, in college to be one of my offensive players, offensive linemen. I mean, the, when you're a defensive lineman watching film – you know, you're you're looking at the the you know all the talents and things and and the, the things that you know offensive linemen do well, but there's always that guy who has a little bit extra, who brings a little bit of that nastiness uh, that defines you know good offensive linemen or, or, or good offensive lines always have one of those nasty guys on them, uh, and so I'm looking at all the intangibles, right? I'm looking at is he a leader? Um, I'm also looking at obviously the physical aspect of it and how he holds up. But then if there's one thing I'm putting a premium on is, does he finish through the whistle? Is he nasty? Is he getting into, getting into fights? Is he, is he bringing it every play? Um, especially as an offensive lineman, that, just that alone showing up on tape goes a long way. Because, right? again, I've been on some defensive lines where, you know, we see a guy like Richie Incognito and we're like, oh, here we go. You know, we got to play this guy. Uh, uh, and it sets the tone for the rest of the offensive line. So, uh, I think that if, if I'm going to put one trait on an offensive lineman that I'm looking for, it's that nasty, gritty, uh, uh, Richie Incognito type mentality. And before and, we, before we, I just want to ask him about uh, before we get into these plays, how does that on a snap to snap basis uh, playing against an offensive line or a single offensive lineman that just has that reputation? You mentioned Incognito; he's probably the most well known. Uh, dirty, you know, tough offensive lineman in the league. How does that on a snap just coming into the game preparation and then once you're out there from play to play, how does that uh, affect a defense and kind of take away uh, from their ability to dominate the game? Yeah, I mean, you go into the game thinking we, we have to go to battle and it's, it's going to be a battle every play because incognito's coming, right? And if you're not looking, he's going to push you over the pile. He's going to punch you in the neck. Uh, he's going to, you know, he's going to take it to you. So you've got to be ready and going and prepared and ready for, you know, a fist fight. It's a, you know, what Rex used to call a double chin strap game, right? And he's going to bring the funk. And so you got to match them. And, uh, you know, it adds another, another layer, another element uh, uh, of difficulty when you're playing against a good offensive line. Uh, if they're nasty and have that, you know, ability to finish you. Uh, and there's nothing worse when you're looking from the sideline as a team and you see your guys getting driven into the ground or, or knocked over, or, you know, pushed around. I mean, just the mentality. Uh, and Rex, again, Rex is always about building the bully on offense and defense. And so I think that it goes a long way when you have those guys on your team, uh, but especially on the offensive line. I mean, you just need one guy who's a tone setter on that offensive line, and everybody else seems to follow suit. 
And Mike, on this play specifically, because this is going to be something that's interesting when we get into the tackles next, uh, but Hennessy 58 here, and you're a guy who, obviously, you're an interior offensive lineman, so for the most part, you face interior, or sorry, you're an interior defensive lineman. For the most part, you face interior offensive lineman. And as I said, when we talk about the tackles, one of the things that we wanted to get your perspective on was uh, the ability to pick up stunts, because anytime you face a tackle, it was probably on a stunt or something where it were uh, to, to try to confuse the offensive line. Hennessy, who's at center, so he's not a tackle, does a really good job on this play of picking up the stunt. What are kind of the most important attributes for a player? You know, I guess we'll start with the interior offensive lineman to pick up maybe the faster, quicker defensive ends. And then for the tackles, when they're facing a guy like you or another defensive tackle or one tech or a three tech, what are just some of the most important attributes to have to be able to recognize a stunt is coming? Uh, obviously, you've talked a lot about film work, uh, but then a, being able to pick it up like Hennessy does well here. Well, and I think this uh, this real I mean, this is really speaks to an offensive line's communication and their cohesion, uh, because obviously picking up stunts is more than just just one guy. Uh, and so, you know, whenever we would play an offensive line that had a new guy in there or was struggling to communicate, struggling to get on the same page, that was the first thing that went in for pass rush game plan is, hey, we got to run stunts because these guys are not on the same page and they're not going to be able to pick them up. Um, so as much as it is, you know, one guy being able to adjust, uh, it's about communication and the, the all five guys being on the same page. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, you, you got to have guys that are aware. you got to have guys that, you know, recognize, okay, this guy's stunting down. Who's coming from behind? Is somebody coming from the other side? Uh, you know, so constantly trying to see, you know, where the stunt is coming from. And that obviously comes from film work as well. Uh, but then again, the, the biggest thing to stop with stunts is having an offensive line on the same page. If everybody's on the same page, you, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's a text, if it's a you, if it's a, if it's a Ted, it don't matter. They're going to pick it up. And I want to ask you about this first play. Uh, ben, if you could go back to the yeah. first play of uh, Biotis. This one's really interesting because I feel like uh, this was a play where the, he, where, Tyler Biotish, the center for Wisconsin, who's actually highlighted here. I found a video that helps us out. But he makes a really good block here. And I feel like the running back kind of made the wrong read here and should have went through kind of behind 71 there. And instead he leaps over 61 Biotish. But uh, on this play, he kind of pancakes. They're kind of an outside zone play here, a little bit more going on. But uh, from your perspective, and it looks like that is, uh, I think that is the uh, two-eye or three technique there. But he gets a pancake here. Uh, from, how do you avoid that as a defensive tackle? Because that's obviously the last thing you want, unless you're trying to create penetration. The last thing you want to be is on the ground. So what are the keys to, from a defensive line perspective, keep yourself up, keep yourself in the play, uh, making an impact, and not get pan, uh, pancaked like on this play? Yeah, I mean, I don't, again, I don't know what the defense is doing there, but they have a call. But the, fir the first thing I can tell you is if you're, you know, if you're three technique – on that where is he if you're a three yeah technique, it looks like he's a three technique there yeah you got to stay out there i mean he takes a bad step he's inside now you got problems uh and then another thing you spoke to is penetration i mean he, he you know he he falls steps he's out of his gap and then he stops his feet and that's just the recipe for a disaster i mean this is a this is a pancake waiting to happen so you got to get off the football stay in your gap and you got to be going uh, you know you want to be penetrating, knocking guys back on their side of the line of scrimmage, not stepping down, catching a double team, and then stopping your feet. I mean, that's just – that's going to get you killed every time. And it kind of speaks to the, the nastiness that you were talking about earlier that you wanted in an offensive line. As we move forward to the tackles here, I think you're going to like this prospect the most when you talk about having a guy who's, who's nasty uh, and finishes plays. I'll just let the rest of the interior offensive line run through. But this is Makai Becton from Louisville, who's an absolute giant and is quick on his feet. And, and scouts, I mean, you can read about it, have, have talked about how his film is probably the most exciting. He's probably the, the highest ceiling play, uh, highest ceiling offensive tackle uh, in the draft, as you see here at, at left tackle. He has some holes in his game, but he clearly has the, the most fun highlights to watch as, as you watch him just absolutely <laughs> ragged all the, the outside linebacker there. Um, obviously a fun player to watch and I'll let I'll go through some of his other plays here we can go back and talk about them this next play is, is a run block for him where he just gets to the second level and completely finishes he's right here this left tackle here who just <laughs> finds his man and, and obliterates him Ooh. and then this last play it's uh, interesting I have the to hear. same reaction when I watch that <laughs> literally the exact same noise it is interesting to hear a defensive lineman get excited about offensive line highlights yeah and then this last play we were pretty interested in about 
his technique here. Clearly, it's a quarterback draw, so he knows the pot where, where he has to protect. Uh, but this little hand swat technique that he has, we kind of yeah. wanted to get your thoughts on on how effective, I guess, that technique is. Because it seems like that could be something that gets him in trouble. But at the same time, it just shows how strong he is. The fact that he's – I mean, Julian Okora is the outside linebacker there who's going to be a, a second or a third round pick at edge. And he just uses one arm and just completely shoves, shoves him out of the way. So – after watching three plays of Makai Becton, kind of what are your thoughts? Does he, does he kind of fit the mold of, of your gritty, nasty uh, offensive lineman that you'd want in your team? Oh, I mean, no question. Based off of these, these three plays he does, obviously he's big and strong enough to block all your guys up front and block them well. But, you know, this stuff is impressive. But you can get him up to the third level, right, second and third level, and be able to be athletic enough at his size to toss around a safety. I mean, that's, that's hard to do. Uh, given how hard it is to block those guys in the open field. This QB draw this QB draw play, I mean, that's the standard technique at tackle, right? You take a little short step, you get your guy to uh, commit up field, a little short set, get your guy to commit up field, and then just hump them through. Uh, but you're right, again, you can see the strength. Because usually that'll, you know, one or two steps, and that guy will be able to stop. I mean, he's five yards up, up the field by the time he's done, you know, by the time the momentum's done. So uh, that's a perfect block. Uh, and yes, I mean, and, and you can see he's massive as well. So that would be a, a, a huge pickup. You pick up one of those, you know, one of those centers uh, that you said, now you've moved 60 to guard and you put that guy at left tackle. Uh, you're, you know, you're in good shape. That's a good offensive line. And Becton, who's so huge, I, I believe he's 6'8", but what are the differences? Uh, you talked before when we were talking about Quinn and Williams um, playing against Lane Johnson and the differences between playing tackles, but in particular, a, a huge guy like Becton, who's closer to 400 pounds than 300 and is, you know, could play in the NBA power forward or uh, even a small ball center in today's NBA. But uh, when you're playing against a guy as huge as he is, uh, what are the di- what? How are you trying to beat a guy like that? How do you make up for the strengths that he offers? You know his literal power and strength, and uh, then how do you kind of exploit his size to try and take advantage of him? Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, you have to stay low uh, because, like I said before, with Lane Johnson, those guys are generally going to stand up a little bit higher uh, and give you their chest. So you got to stay low. You got to get your hands inside, and then you got to get your momentum going on their side of the football. Right? You don't want to. Uh, try to play uh, play on the line of scrimmage. I mean, just too strong, right? You're not going to be able to win that that strength battle. So you got to bring, you know, you got to get your momentum going and, and bring the fight to him so that he can't get his momentum going. He just has too much strength. Um, and you got to you, know, you got to stay low. You got to get your hands inside. But even then, I mean, it's no guarantee when you have a guy who's this who's that special with that size, uh, that special with his ability to redirect and move and be explosive. Um, uh, there's no guarantee, you know, some guys just are just bigger, faster, stronger. And this looks like to be one of those guys that even if you played perfect technique, you're going to have a long day against that guy. Kind of reminds me of uh, Chris Samuel. I don't know if you guys remember that, the, the left tackle. Remember him from uh, uh, the Redskins. I mean, he kind of looks like Chris Samuel in the sense that uh, that aggressiveness and that, that just uh, ability to finish his play, finish his guy and, and, and he's got looks like he's got good waist bend too. Looks like he's he's athletic and he's able to bend and move. And so this guy certainly looks. I think you said one of the the scouts that he's the most uh, fun to watch on tape or the, the most potential. I mean, I I can see that, and I, I'm not even a trained trained scout. Yeah, how important I guess would you say is, is coaching for for a guy like who like Beckton, who's a high ceiling. He probably potentially has the lowest floor out of the there's four top offensive line uh, offensive tackle prospects that the Jets are looking at. There's, there's a few others, but there's generally four and then we're going to look at them all of them in a second. But Makai Becton is up there and he's always kind of listed as that high ceiling, low floor type of guy. I mean, how important is it for him to get into NFL training camp with a good offensive line coach? Because you can see the talent is there. I mean, how many of these guys that have all these physical attributes that end up busting, how much would you say that's attributed to, to bad coaching? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. And it's not so much, you know, it's going to be the coaching, obviously going to be the coaching you get on the field, uh, but it's going to be keeping his confidence up uh, and, and recognizing that, okay, I have a guy who was drafted high, uh, who's, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him to perform. Uh, and so instead of continuously reminding him that he has to perform because he got drafted high, uh, being able to, to basically nurture a guy and say, look, uh, you know, this takes time, but you're going to keep working. We're going to get it and, and just build them up and encourage him. Uh, I think, 
again, the downfall with a lot of these top picks is uh, coaches and, and that are too critical on them uh, when everybody else has already given them so much crap for maybe not performing at you know the spot that they're uh, the, you know, living up to the standard given where they were drafted. So I've, I guess for me personally, I always benefited from coaches that encouraged me as much as they criticized and, and, uh, and picked apart my game. And so you're, you're going to get a coach that knows the game, right, and is able to teach him the ins and outs, the X's and O's and all that stuff and the fundamentals, that's important. Uh, but a coach that's also going to encourage him and, and allow him to to grow and and, and uh, continue to, to build him up and get him mentally prepared for not just playing on Sundays, but everything that comes with being an NFL player that got drafted high. So we have another one of the top four tackles that the Jets could be looking at. Uh, a guy who actually seems to be maybe the most likely pick for them at number 11. This is Andrew Thomas, the left tackle from Georgia and here he makes a really good uh, has a really good pass set against uh, another guy is probably going to be a first round pick uh, Kayla Von Chase on outside linebacker edge rusher from LSU but this is really interesting because uh, once you really get into and both of us both me and Ben have just gotten into watching film so much and really there's just so much in terms of the hand fighting uh, in the trenches that uh, you know you don't really notice until you really get into it but Thomas here does a really nice job and just the technique he uses here we are curious about because he comes in to his pass set and then kind of has his hands wide then kind of like claps chase on's hands together and then is able to get on top of him and put him into the ground so uh what about this technique is this something that you've seen uh to because this really seems like a kind of an unconventional way to handle this so uh, what are your thoughts on this technique here from thomas at left tackle yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's a hand fight. I mean, it's a chess match. You know, like you said, it's, it's a hand fight, and it's, it's a chess match. Who's going to throw first? What is the move going to look like? Uh, and so you, you see both these guys are waiting, 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 because they don't want to be the first guy that throws their hands out there and gets them chopped down. Uh, and so he does a good job of showing them, but not putting them, you know, not committing them too fast. Uh, and, and what's interesting is at the NFL level, and I think also at the college level, a lot of these rushers – uh, and offensive linemen are, are working with mixed martial arts guys now. I remember when I was with the Jets, we worked with the Gracie, uh, Gracie people out in New Jersey um, cool. <laughs> just to, to get this hand work because it really is. I mean, this is what it is up front on, on pass downs is uh, it's a hand fight. And so whoever has the best, you know, the, 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 the most patience and uh, the, the best ability to, to – lock in on their target and, and use those moves is going to win. Uh, and so, again, that's what I see here from 71, just great patience with his hands, not worried, not having to commit, even going against a great player, not feeling like he has to commit right away. Obviously, very athletic. That was a great set. Uh, just waits, waits, waits. And then as soon as he gets his opening, as soon as 18 commits his hand, he's able to lock on, boom, and, you know, just trap him down. That was so – uh, a guy who obviously knows how to use his hands and uh, neutralize his opponent in the in the hand fighting game. And when there's a stalemate like that, because as you mentioned, like uh, in this next play he gets beat, but on that one, uh, the first play, the good rep. Uh, when there's a stalemate like that, and you know both the offensive lineman and the rusher are kind of being patient with their approach, does that favor the offensive lineman? Because obviously you don't have to hold up very long to win the rep. You know, usually the ball's coming out in two three seconds, so. Uh, on a play like that where, you know, both the – you know, obviously Thomas comes in there. He thinks he's going to be patient and kind of sit back in that rush. And then Chase on is kind of waiting for Thomas to throw his hands so he can make his move. Does that favor the offensive lineman when both guys come in with that kind of approach? Oh, no question. No question. I mean, at some point, 18 knows he has to throw. He, he's got to commit his hand. Because you're right, you, you can't dance – you know, you can't dance with him for too long. You only got three to five seconds, right, to get, to get back there. So – uh, that's why you're hoping to get an offensive lineman that's going to commit his hands right away. Uh, so there's other things you can do, right? So th again, this is a, this isn't just one rep. This is a, an entire chess match that goes on for a whole game. And so, you know, starting off with a bull rush, you know, make him think that you're going to bring it so that he feels like he has to sit down and throw his hands and then get into that hand fighting game. Uh, because you're right, as a, as a rusher, you don't, you don't want to get into this game where you're four or five steps back and nobody's throwing their hands yet because, you know, the ball's going to be gone by the time you, even if you eventually win, the ball's going to be gone. Yeah, and then the second play is uh, not as successful for Thomas this time. And it's these two guys again, and this time it goes 
completely differently. This time, Chason comes right in with the speed rush, and he beats Thomas around the edge uh, and gets a – this one's ruled incomplete, but essentially gets to the quarterback and blows up this play. So uh, we do get a better view of it there in that second angle. So uh, what are you seeing here that leads to this loss uh, by Thomas? It's just a fantastic get off by 18. I mean, he just – he is right with the football. I mean, look at how fast he gets off the ball. You know, so there's some guys that get – when you get a when you get a beat on the snap count or jump on the ball like that, I mean, watch it. He is right – as soon as that thing gets snapped, he's gone. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are at left tackle if you have a guy that's, that's got you by two steps before you're out of your stance. So this could be a, a mixture of him being a little bit slow out of his stance and just that the right end just being perfect with the snap. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to stop a guy that, that gets that kind of get off off the football. And how about this first step? Because it looks like his first step is really short and doesn't get a lot of depth with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, that's totally different from what he did last time. I mean, last time he had a great, great long step, was able to get out of there. Uh, maybe this play was before that, and that forced him to start doing that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he, short, he almost short sets it a little bit. Uh, I don't know if he thought maybe 17 was going to give him more there, or if that was going to force 18 back inside uh, that would allow him to play a little bit slower, but obviously that wasn't the case. He does recover. I mean, he does, he does get there enough, but obviously it causes the incomplete. Uh, so, but I, I, if you're going to, if I'm pointing to one thing right now, it's get off. That, that get off was just spot on. Yeah, that snap timing is so important on the defensive line, not to cut you off, Ben, but. Uh, it is just so important on both sides. And, you know, we see it a lot on defense just – like this play is an example. You could just see – and he actually it actually looks like he started getting off there a little bit early, but still mm-hmm. was able to get it. How important is snap timing uh, on the offensive line? Because obviously you have that advantage of knowing the snap count, kind of having uh, the knowledge of when the ball is supposed to be snapped. But it's still important to get uh, – you know, get off the ball really quick and get into your stance. So how important is that? And how do uh, – how has a defensive lineman – you kind of exploit O linemen who can't get off really well. Yeah, I mean, so right here, if I'm 71, you know, and I'm dealing, I'm dealing with this more than once. I'm telling the quarterback, hey, you know, give a hard count, give something to slow these guys down, right? Change the cadence because you're right. That's their advantage. Their advantage is to be a step ahead. Uh, and so you got to change the snap count up. You got to put some hard counts in, some quick counts in. Keep the defensive line off guard because that. You know, that's a huge advantage for us if we can get that extra step. And so and, – and you're always trying to figure out snap counts and, and listen to TV copies to see if you can get an idea on if different colors or different cadences correlate to different snap counts uh, because it's a huge advantage one way or the other. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's important for both sides. But, again, on offense right here, if I'm dealing with this too much, I'm saying, look, this guy's getting such a jump on the football. we got to slow him down. Uh, uh, change the snap count up. Yeah, and this guy Chase on here, I mean, he, he most likely won't be the Jets pick, but, I mean, he has met with the team, and the Jets obviously do need an edge rusher. Obviously, the Jets want to get uh, mo- probably an offensive lineman or, or a receiver or whatnot. But in your playing days with the Jets, the Jets didn't really have a, a guy like Chase on off the edge, a, a, a speed guy off the edge. I guess they had Aaron Mabin in, in 2011, but as good as Calvin Pace and Brian Thomas were, they weren't a guy like Chase on who has this first step here who can just really get around uh, the offensive tackle. How much does that change a defense? When you were first on, we talked about how much Revis, uh, you know, changed the defense, but how much does it help to have, you know, a guy like this or in the NFL today, a guy like Josh Allen or even a Khalil Mack uh, who just has these, you know, amazing first steps and is just able to instantly uh, get off the block. What does it change about a defense and what they're able to call? Yeah, you know, I actually was able to experience this out in Kansas City with Tom Bahali and Justin Houston and Dee Ford uh, and those guys who are great outside pass rushers. Uh, and it's, it's great for the guys inside because if these guys don't get there, a lot of times these quarterbacks are having to step up at, at a minimum because they got these, those, those outside rushers in their face. And that allows a lot of those big guys up front to make some, some sacks, get some sacks and make some plays because you got a quarterback always oh, getting flushed up into you. Um, the thing with the Jets that goes back to Revis again is we were unique in the sense that we didn't need that, right? We didn't need somebody because you had Revis and you had Cromartie. So now you can, now you, you had all these extra DBs that you could free up to blitz. And obviously, you know, you, it's nice to have fast defensive ends, but you know, to have a corner like Eric Coleman 
uh, coming off the edge is going to be going 100 miles an hour. That's a lot harder to, to stop. Uh, <laughs> so we had a unique, you know, a unique uh, uh, little game plan, a unique, uh, unique ability there with the Jets uh, because we had Revis and Cromartie in their primes. Uh, but, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, great, it's great, and it's great to see – Guys like that, I mean, guys like that, I remember D. Ford and Tom Mahali and Justin Houston, they, they were getting two or three sacks a game each. So that's fun. Man. That's, that's fun when you see those guys always back there eating, you know. Someday, someday the Jets will hopefully have an edge rusher like that. Potentially this year, but, but probably not in the first round. Two more prospects, then we have your, your, your clips, and then we'll, we'll try to get out of here. Thank you for, for being so gracious oh, with your time here. Um, so this is another prospect. We talked about the four. We've talked about Mackay Becton from Louisville. We've talked about Andrew Thomas from Georgia. In no particular order, these are the top four. And this, this is a guy named Tristan Wirfs from Iowa who, you know, dominated the combine. A lot of people think he could go four to the Giants. He could potentially go eight to the Cardinals. Most people don't see him falling to the Jets. But, you know, you never know. The, the draft is pretty crazy. He's the right tackle here, but a lot of people see maybe he could move inside the guard. Um, and I believe this is his good play. We, we tried to do a good play and a bad play for each, but Becton, we, it was just too fun to look at the good plays. But here, I mean, he's a guy who, who clearly displays his athleticism uh, on this play as he's able to just completely stuff the outside or the, the edge rusher there outside and then doesn't allow him inside. Uh, you know, how important, I mean, I guess obviously it's important, but how hard was it um, for you to, to face a guy who was so good at, at, at counterattacking in the offensive lineman? Because you see a guy like this, I mean, I actually don't know who, who this USC player is. Um, but you see how he has a counter move here coming with the spin. And this is a guy like Dwight Freeney was so elite at, was to get a guy's outside and then spin back inside. Uh, when you have an offensive lineman that can shut down those counter rush moves and buy your quarterback an extra time, uh, again, I mean, just what does that add to your offensive line? Because we've talked about cohesiveness with the offensive line, and that was definitely something that the Jets struggled with and a lot of mental errors. But they also had guys who could really only shut down the first defensive attack and any sort of counters like these – generally we're getting through right yeah no you know for me personally I wasn't a guy who had too many too many pass rush moves uh up my sleeve so if, if my first one didn't hit a lot of times it turned into a bull rush because I just you know I didn't have the athletic ability to do that kind of stuff uh one thing I can tell you about anybody coming from Iowa whether it be 74 or anybody is they're going to be strong right? I mean this is a program that's known for strength that's known for putting out guys who are strong guys and those are the guys that I had trouble with, right? So it's a guy that can, can, can match your speed, that's not going to let you get around him. But then when you go to bring the fight to him, he's strong enough to neutralize you. Uh, so I played a lot of, against a lot of offensive linemen that were athletic. But then, you know, the second you bring the funk to them, they didn't just – they didn't have it in the – you know, they, they didn't have the, uh, the ability to slow you down, right? They just weren't, weren't strong enough. Uh, when you get guys like this who have, a, who have the best of both worlds, right? They're athletic, they can move, uh, but at the same time, when you go to, to, to bring it, they're going to have that strength and power as well. Uh, again, Quentin Nelson is the paradigm case of having both athleticism and strength. Uh, that, that's, I mean, there's, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, as we move forward to maybe a negative play from, from Wurfs, and this is also – you know, falls again on the cohesiveness of an offensive line. But kind of, what do you see here from from specifically Tristan Wirth, um, but this this Iowa offensive line as a whole? As USC brings a bit of a blitz here, and he, he, you know, he gets beat, and he probably would get called for a hold in the NFL. It doesn't matter either way, as number nine for USC gets through. But uh, I was listening to an interview with Connor McGovern. And he talked about when you have a guy who gets a lot of holding penalties, generally that points to bad technique. Is that something that that you see as well? Is is the guys who are mostly penalized are generally guys who are undisciplined, obviously, but who have bad technique. Is this, this spe uh, specific hold maybe an example of bad technique by Werfs, or is this just kind of how the, the, the rush happened? Yeah, it's hard to tell. I, don't, I can't see the end zone. But, but you're right. I think holding does speak to bad technique and or bad um, uh, or lack of athleticism, right? Lack of ability to adjust, lack of ability to, to change the movement, things like that. Uh, but this just looks like, I don't know, he, again, another shorter set, and he just lets the guy get on his edge. Uh, maybe he thought the ball was going to be out faster and he didn't need to set deep. Um, uh, but, yeah, but no, I mean, uh, th that's certainly something you got to be aware of. A lot of holding calls uh, is, is a number of, you know, puts up a number of red flags, uh, the two, two primary ones being – uh, athleticism and a lack of ability to adjust and uh, then poor, poor technique. You'd rather be the latter, right? Because if you have a guy who has the athleticism and the strength and the speed and all that, 
uh, that you can, you know, you can work the technique on. Uh, that's, that's, that's better than having a guy who, uh, um, who just doesn't have the, uh, uh, the ability to adjust, you know, the physical ability to adjust and there's really no change in that. Right. And you obviously hear that the phrase that there's holding on every play in the NFL. What is that? Take me through the art of trying to draw holding penalties, because there obviously there is some form of, of holding on, on every sort of play. But if you were facing a guy who you noticed was getting pretty grabby with, with that, that number 70 jersey, what techniques do you try to employ to, to get that ref to, to throw the flag? Oh, I mean, you're, you know, you're throwing your hands up. You're really trying to sell it, right? I, I remember <laughs> pulling this move on Joe Thomas a couple times and getting – getting the flag drawn uh, on him, you know, you, you, you almost let them get inside a little bit and then try to shrug and pull and make sure your jersey's pulling and throw your hands up and then obviously looking at the ref, like, what's going on, you know? Uh, so you, you're acting a little bit. You got you to act because you're right. It, there is holding on it. Holding, I mean, it's not really holding, but there is, uh, there is grabbing on every play. And so uh, holding comes when you can make it look more extreme than it really is. So you should take improv classes in addition to martial arts. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so, so this is the last of the four rookie tackles we'll be looking at. This guy is my personal favorite prospect and a lot of people's number one tackle. Jedrick Wills, the right tackle for Alabama, number 74. And he just really has the complete set of tools. He has the nastiness you talked about, but he's also a tremendous athlete and technician. But this is a really good rep and protection here. Uh, kind of holds on. Uh, really well there and doesn't allow much of any penetration on this really deep drop. So uh, I think one of the most interesting things uh, with the tackle, and this is an interesting rep because it's kind of, he kind of comes down to get into yeah. this protection rep. So uh, what do you think is different about uh, whenever you have to come into uh, as a defensive tackle, both from your perspective uh, and both the offensive tackle, when you have a unique rep like this, when it's not straight one-on-one -on -one, uh, from the jump, but then it ends up being a one-on-one -on -one battle. Yeah, th well, this is tough from a, from a defensive tackle perspective when you have a you know, often when you're going to rush a three technique and then all of a sudden you have an offensive tackle who comes down almost like a run block. Uh, and I think it looks like well, this is I, th it looks like they're selling. This might be like a play action here because they're pulling the guard around, so they're trying to make it look like a double team. Uh, uh, I, I'd have to see it more from the end zone, but I think this is a, a play action trying to sell the power uh, and then throwing the football. But yeah, I mean, you can see he's locked out. He's got good base. There's just there's just nowhere for that guy to go. Um, and so for for a defensive lineman, when you get these play action uh, reads, you, is you really have to uh, be able to transfer from pass from run to pass, right? So uh, right now I'm trying to flip my hips and get through that. As soon as I recognize that that's a pass, now uh, I have to get back down in my stance and try to flip my hips through uh, and get on the guy's edge. But it's it's really hard to do especially here where they're mimicking power and you're getting a double team right there. Uh, but yeah, but no, I mean, you can see he's got, you know, from the little bit I can see on the edge there, good, good athleticism, good, good base, uh, playing low. So, so yeah, he looks good. This was probably my favorite play to watch in this whole review. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this because it's a little bit of bad, and a little bit of good um, from, from Wills here, uh, the right tackle. As you see, he'll fall down. He falls down on his butt here uh, and just gets, you know, completely balled over. But he gets back on his feet, finishes the block, and this play actually ends up setting up the touchdown in the previous play that we showed up. There was a little out of order. Uh, this play ends up going for like 60 yards. I mean, I guess kind of can you speak to the, the balance aspect of an offensive lineman? I mean, how important it is? Because he does fall off balance here, but his athletic ability clearly shows. That's one of the, the, the main ways you can tell how athletic somebody is, how quickly they can get to the ground and back up. And he clearly shows that although he loses the bull rush and loses his balance and falls over, as you said, we don't have the end zone angle, so maybe he got tripped by a right guard or whatnot. But his ability to just get right back up into his set and stop this rush, which ends up saving the play. Yeah, that's really impressive. I mean, that's, that's hard to do. And I know a lot of guys, the second their butt hits the ground, you know, that's it. They're, they're not trying to, to jump back up. I mean, he, you know, he, he gets right, right off the ground and is able to get back up and, and save that play. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And so you've got a guy that's obviously athletic but relentless, right? He's not – this isn't a guy that's going to you know, pack it in easy. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, you're starting to see a lot of those, a lot of those traits that you look for, and that's one of those plays that you know a lot of a lot of people will give him a minus. But uh, you're not going to win every one. But how, how you respond uh, to you know when something bad happens is obviously important. And 
the, the ability to jump back up, to be athletic, to get back up. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys, 310, 315, 320 pounds, you get knocked down like that. It's hard to get back up at all, let alone fast enough to stop the blitzer from getting to the uh, quarterback. So that's, a, that's an impressive play all the way around. Can, can you guys hear me now? Because I think I yeah. cut out the yeah, first time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I have no idea what happened there. But I, I want to ask you something about that first play uh, when he went uh, on that unique run play action fake they kind of did so you you talked about playing from pass to run how do you uh, approach that from your perspective is it based on down and distance just kind of predicting what the most likely thing they're yeah. going to do is you know based on the field position and those factors is it uh, reading keys in terms of how they're lined up what you saw on film how do you uh, approach a play coming in uh, in terms of whether you're going to play it run first or pass first and how do you make that transition if it's not what you expect it to be it's one of the harder things to do, right? I mean, and that's why a lot of teams will, want, will run uh, play action because it's very difficult to transition from run to pass. Uh, you know, the, 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 the best chance you're going to have is if you're running some kind of defense where you're just firing off the ball and you can let loose uh, and you're playing low uh, and it doesn't matter what you're getting, whether it be a hard, you know, hard set or a run set or a pass set you're doing, you know, you're just getting off the football. Those are the type of plays, those are the type of, of guys that are going to get, uh, you know, allow, still allow you to be productive in the pass game on the play action passes because they're, you know, they're going no matter what. A guy like me who's, who's going to two gap, who's going to play the run to the last second, um, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and so like I was saying before, I think the best thing you can do is start throwing your hips and try to, uh, try to get on the edge of a guy. I know sometimes we would have built-in – um, uh, games up front. So if we got play action and all of a sudden it was a game uh, or all of a sudden it was a pass, we would, you know, we would start to run picks up front and try to free up somebody. Uh, but it, it is, it's, it's really a difficult, uh, difficult play to, to, to get back there. And that's why a lot of teams utilize it, especially with going against teams that have good pass rushers. And then look, when you call a stun and you're playing to run, uh, playing to run one of those, uh, and then a team runs the ball straight up the middle on you, how do you, uh, is there a downside to the, is that the downside of running stunts if a team tries to run on you and how do you adjust from that if you're playing to call a stunt then a team you know runs a uh, runs a ball against you yeah you i mean at least the teams i was on you we weren't going to run stunts until it, until we were in a, uh, an, an almost obvious certain, passing situation yeah yeah, yeah you don't, you don't want to be running them too much on on rundowns because you're right i mean it can open up a big crease uh, now sometimes they can get home on a run, you know, on a run play, and you can you can make a big play. But, uh, but yeah, it's a high risk, high reward, I guess. Uh, so we would we would save them for you know third third and long dime nickel packages things like that. Uh, and anytime a team, you know, anytime we guessed and we guessed wrong, uh, usually those those runs would break out because it's just it's hard to redirect and stop and make a play against the run when you're running those stunts. And then what? From a pass rushing perspective, because we've been talking about, uh, we've been looking at a lot of pass rush reps here. We've seen some some wins, some losses uh, from both sides. Uh, but as a in the pass rushing game, if you're looking back at the film, uh, if Rex Ryan is taking you through the film uh, post game, and you're looking at some pass rush reps uh, in the defensive line room, what are some of the things that uh, the top things that a coach does not want to see in the pass rushing game? Because ob obviously, you can't win all the time. You're only going to get, you know, even if you're really good, a handful of wins a game. And if you're lucky, one sack. Uh, so, but what are some of the things from a technical perspective in terms of approach and mentality, some of the things that a coach does not want to see from a defensive tackle as a pass rusher? So they did, a, when I was out in Kansas City, the, the coaches did a study in 2013 watching all the sacks from the year before. And what they found is uh, of the 90% of the sacks, you know, 10% 10, 10 of the 100% of sacks, 10% of them were guys just having a really good move, uh, landing, you know, you know, some kind of spin or hands or uh, knocking guys' hands down, things like that. This, this, these kind of plays, get off plays. Uh, but he said the other 90% was just get off pad level and relentlessness, right? And so it was that second and third effort to get there that allowed 90% of the sacks to occur. Uh, and so one of the biggest things that, you know, when you're, when you're sitting in that film room and, you're looking at the game from Sunday, you want to make sure even on the pass round, the pass downs where you're blocked, that you're continuing to fight and try to get back there, get your hands up, you know, do whatever you can to get free, get loose, uh, because uh, those a lot of times will end up in sacks, whether it be, 
you know, the outside guys flushing the, the quarterback into you or, uh, you know, or, you know, offensive linemen letting up and now you have a chance to get back there. Uh, but the last thing you want to do is let up and not, you know, not give 100% all the way through the whistle. Yeah, and then that's definitely something you did. And, I mean, we have a few plays here at the end. I, and the last one most notably, which we were actually talking about before, but we do have this play with the Chargers. Uh, ben, if you want to kind of set the stage for this one. Well, I, I will, Michael. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm laying out the red carpet for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe this was uh, – yeah, no, it was. I don't, I don't know why I started with I believe. It's 2009 divisional round. Uh, obviously, you guys had back-to-back wins against the Bengals. This was a game that nobody really gave the Jets a chance in. Um, most people thought, okay, well, their Cinderella run, you know, has ended. They beat the Bengals. They got the divisional round. We'll see what they can do in 2010. Road game on the West Coast. I mean, there was a lot of things going against the Jets in this game, but they really played uh, a, a dominant defensive game in this game, specifically in the second half. This is a fourth quarter play, Mike, and, and you didn't bring this up when we talked to you about, you know, maybe some of your best plays of your career. But this, uh, to me, on first down, you know, considering where the charges were field position-wise, I mean, you talk, to, you talk about hustle, and then we've, we've, the, the three plays that we have uh, compiled here, a lot of it, as you talked about, pad level and hustle. This is a terrific play where you're wrapping up Phil Rivers. Can you kind of just take us through, I don't know if you remember, obviously it's about a decade ago, kind of what's going through your head or what you would imagine is going through your head uh, on this play as, yeah. as you celebrate here with uh, Brian Thomas? <laughs> this was funny because uh, all week Mike Pettin, our defensive coordinator, was saying, look, DeVito – screens and draws like I want you focused on screens and draws I'm not worried about your pass rush you know getting sacks anything like that you know this is a screen team this is a draw team we got to be able to stop that so focus on those things and so I think he gave me a a minus on this play just as a joke because I didn't listen to him and and uh, went back there and got a sack but this is uh this offensive guard here Louis Vasquez actually ended up having a really good career uh and he was a big strong tough player played for uh San Diego and then for um, the Broncos and so I played against him a bunch so I was really happy about this play this was obviously a crucial spot in the game Uh, got them you know knocked them back put them in bad field position uh, bad down in distance so uh, so yeah this was one of the one of the bigger plays and one of those uh, pictures I have at home on the wall uh, is me sacking Phillip Rivers right that's one of those things that you get to tell your kids about. And these next two plays are hustle plays but this was actually a nice win from you you kind of got them with the bull rush here. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, this was my thing, right? I was like, got to be able to bull rush. It was my strength, my power. Can I overwhelm a guy? Uh, and so, again, I'm not, I'm not somebody you're worried about uh, in a pass down. So I had a lot of one-on-one. So every once in a while, I was able to make, uh, make the most of it. And the coverage, too, you talked about. I included the coverage angle here. You can see there's nowhere to go. And nowhere. Uh, that's nowhere why Rivers just steps up and gives you that opportunity and just – Goes to show how, you know, and this is really the whole defense. It wasn't just Revis, but uh, how good that secondary was, how they could create those opportunities for you guys up front. I would seen nothing like it. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. And it, it did, it, it made things so much easier. It made a guy like me, who it takes me 10 seconds to get back there, <laughs> allowed me the ability to get stacks <laughs> and pressures and things like that because there really was, 2009, 2010, there was nowhere to go with the football. Uh, and this was the play that you brought up. And I don't know if you, you had a chance. To, they, I believe they showed this whole game uh, in entirety on NBC Sports. Yeah, they did. Um, uh, like last week. So I don't know if you had a chance to catch it. But I, wa- I went through and I watched the whole game again. And, yeah, this play uh, by you, Mike, was absolutely crucial. I will say Jim Leonard does deserve some props for, for uh, chasing. I believe it was Jason Witten that he chased down all the way to the one-yard line um, who, to set up this play. But, yeah, fourth – Fourth quarter, under 10 minutes to go. Jets are down seven, third and goal. At the very least, it seems like the, the Cowboys are going to go up 10. Uh, and, and you obviously, uh, it speaks to your hustle, uh, make a hell of a play uh, on this one to, to bring down Tony Romo and get the, uh, the strip fumble on him here. I'm not exactly quite sure what, what Tony was doing here uh, with the ball. Kind of held it out there like a loaf of bread. But, yeah. uh, but your thoughts, I mean, just kind of take me through this game. I mean, obviously, this is a really emotional game for a lot of people in New York, and, and this was one of the biggest moments in it. Just kind of what does this play mean to you uh, for your career and kind of just take us through it? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those plays. Again, this is a play-action play. That tackle comes down hard on me. Uh, so I'm thinking run right away. Uh, and I, I believe I also – the three techniques, so I want to get outside to contain as well. Uh, but – but yeah, I mean, it just all, the, the seas parted and opened up, and I and and Romo sees that you know sees that that lane into the end zone, and 
uh, I just had the ability, you know, just had the, the, the uh, wherewithal, I guess, to, uh, to redirect and run down the line and just at the right place at the right time there. But uh, if there was ever a game I wanted to win, it was this one, right? The 10th, 10th anniversary of 9-11 uh, uh, at home, uh, opening day, September 11th. Uh, and so if there was ever a game to win, it was this one. And to, to be, you know, I, when I first talked to you guys about this last week, I forgot that we were down. I thought we were ahead and this allowed us to end the game. But we actually went down uh, and, and scored after this. So, um, so yeah, so it was uh, – uh, it was certainly a big play and something that, uh, uh, you know, when I think back of a lot of times as a player, you don't remember the bad times, not the good times. This is one of the good teams, times that I actually remember. And this, this was the first regular season Jets game I went to. So it's a great memory for me, too. I, I went to a preseason game against the Eagles for some reason a couple of weeks before this. But this <laughs> yeah, is the yeah. first regular season game that I went to. So that was such an awesome environment. Uh, and an, another thing I want to note in this play, and we kind of touched on it, uh, with the Chargers play, but uh, Revis on top against Des Bryant locks him up, and that's what really allows this to happen. Completely shuts down that fade, uh, and yeah. Romo's looking for it, uh, and that's what leads to the scramble, and then gives you that opportunity. So, just another example of Revis being Revis and giving everyone else a chance to shine. Yeah, I was. I mean, he's just incredible, I mean, and you could just play after play after play with Revis. He's just such an impressive player. Uh, well, in this game in particular against Des Bryant, I mean, I believe the story was that Des Bryant was, was calling to the Jets Brent bench to put uh, to put Revis on him since he, he got Crow for, for a touchdown early in the game. Do you have any stories, I guess, about Revis's trash talk? This game in, in particular was, was a fiery game between him and Des, and, and Des wanted Revis, and he got him and, and was pretty much shut out the rest of the game. Yeah, you know, obviously all that stuff's happening way outside, so I didn't get a chance to hear the trash talk, but uh, the one thing I did get to see was the film on Mondays, and for two years in a row, getting to watch Revis shut down everybody's top wide receiver. Uh, and so, you know, just the most impressive stuff I've ever seen from a player came from Revis. I mean, just his ability to shut down everybody from, from Bryant to Calvin Johnson to Chad, to Chad Johnson to Randy Moss. I mean – just as, you know, as, as, I mean, the best quarterback maybe to ever play the game. And then lastly about this play, um, I, I mean, I've heard some horror stories about what goes on in the bottom of, of a football scrum, a pile. I mean, obviously this was a huge point in the game, and I don't, I don't believe uh, – do you recover this fumble? I can't actually no, remember. Sione Pouha recovered. So, so yeah. Pouha pa gets it, but you're at the bottom of that pile, uh, and it's clearly a violent one. Uh, can you kind of take us through what's going through your head when you're at the bottom of this pile? And then you were at the bottom of a few piles in your careers. You kind of had a knack for forcing fumbles. Um, what is that like at the bottom of those, those piles, especially with a game on the line? Yeah, you get claustrophobic. You know, you, you just got to sit down there and breathe a little bit because you're thinking how I'm stuck underneath like 15 guys here. Um, but with this one, I, I, I didn't realize at first that he had fumbled the football. And it wasn't until I saw everybody – going nuts that, uh, uh, that I realized it. So, uh, so yeah, I was real excited that uh, when I found out, I see everybody jumping and pointing that, uh, that he had fumbled because I didn't know it, you know, at first. So there's nothing being said or nobody getting poked in uh, some unpleasant areas uh, going on at the bottom <laughs> yeah. of these piles? Not that I, not that I can remember, but I'm, I'm sure there was something. And then we, we have this last play. Michael talked about how his first game was, was this game, which was such a lovely, or I guess I shouldn't say lovely, but an amazing game to go to. My first game was this Seahawks game, which, as I mentioned to you before the game, wasn't as great of an experience um, considering, I mean, it's in Seattle, one of the best, um, I mean, I, one of the worst places to play if, if you're a road team or a road fan, surrounded by Seahawks fans. I was about 12 years old just getting bullied uh, <laughs> by Seahawks fans around me. Um, but you delivered probably the, the highlight of the game for the Jets, and I do remember going pretty crazy, 7 nothing first quarter. Uh, and, again, you spoke to, to your hustle as you, as you wrap up Russell Wilson and just kind of ragdoll him, and, and Mo takes it in uh, for six points. I mean, what do you remember at all from this play? And, and, obviously, Russell Wilson's a guy that is very elusive, and not many people can say that they've been able to bring him down. Uh, but you were able to just stay with the play uh, and bring him down. And it, it did change the game for a little bit until the Jets uh, ultimately – couldn't pull it out in the end. Well, that's what I remember. I remember thinking, hey, we're, we're right back in this. Like, we can, you know, we can beat these guys on their own turf, you know, and uh, uh, didn't didn't play out that way. But, uh, but yeah, to get Russell Wilson like that, and, and it's hard to – I mean, there were two or three other plays that I was so close. Right? I remember I have this picture down in my basement where I'm jumping trying to get him. 
Uh, but just for, you know, again, staying, staying active, staying relentless, trying to, uh, to continue to get back there. Sometimes these things happen. You know, a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. And so uh, <laughs> that's what ends up happening here. And uh, uh, I just remember the stadium getting quiet, you know, which is which was – I was screaming. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, this was, uh, this was one, again, one of those top plays for me. And uh, I always get asked, by, you know, who'd you sack? Uh, and I didn't sack a lot of people, but I, I had some cool names, right? Philip Rivers and Russell Wilson being two of them. Yeah, I do remember the other part about this game is it was Mark Sanchez's birthday. So before the game, I did I was able to get Sanchez's attention by yelling "Happy Birthday." I also, me and my friend, started a, a Tanner Purdom chant because we figured we could get his attention since he was the long snapper. That worked. I do believe I got your attention. I mean, I got a few Jets players' attentions just hanging around the end zone waiting for autographs. Cromarty was down there. It was it was a fun time despite. Uh, despite the loss when when a guy like Rex Ryan is watching this play back or any of these plays I mean what are some of the things that he's saying I mean in, in, in those defensive meetings to you and in front of the team you know a play like this where you show great hustle Rex Ryan Mike Pettin what are some, what were some of their I guess catchphrases or some things that they would be saying when they're watching a great play like this they're probably saying why the hell is DeVito on the field when they're passing the football <laughs> <laughs> that was a uh... One of our key defensive uh, uh, philosophies was make sure I was not out there when people were throwing the ball. Um, but, but yeah, no, I mean, it's all about, relent- you know, relentlessness, hustle, those things. Those things transcend not just uh, – those things transcend every level, right, high school, college, NFL, uh, and, and, and defensive coaches know that, right? When, you're, when you want guys that are going to hustle, that are going to be relentless, that are always going to be going after the football – uh, because you're not always going to win first, second, third try. And so, uh, uh, you know, but can you keep the motor going? So high motor guys are, that's obviously a premium, you know, attribute to have. So, so yeah, no, uh, but I, again, I think if it was Rex and Patton, they're saying, <laughs> how can we make sure DeVito's not out there for these past <laughs> And this is an interesting mix too, because we have one play at home and a season opener, such an emotional game in front of the fans at which was uh i believe then it was called the new meadowlands stadium but one play at home and then we got two plays uh a playoff game in san diego and then here in seattle one of the loudest if not the loudest environment to play in, in the nfl so you mentioned how quiet it was in there after uh after mo scored this touchdown ben you were there but from your perspective is it more enjoyable to hear the home crowd going crazy or to silence a visiting crowd Oh, that's fun. It's, it's probably more fun to silence a visiting crowd. Now, I did love the home, the home crowd. The thing that's great about the home crowd is, you know, when you, when you leave, uh, you know, when you leave and you, all the guy, everybody's cheering you on and you're running into the tunnel and there's all those Jets fans standing there uh, to, to greet you as you're running into the tunnel. I mean, that's, that's a lot of fun. And win, winning for the hometown crowd is, is huge. But there is something really nice about sending a uh, sending a team's uh, crowd home early because you're putting the beating on them and, and keeping them silent. So, so yeah, I would say if I had to pick one, it would be silence in the away crowd. Yeah, this was uh, obviously a, a interesting game uh, for a plethora of reasons. I do have one quick question for you. I'm surprised I didn't ask it. Uh, now, you played in these Jets. This is a very non-important question, but it's one that Michael and I care about a lot. You played in these Jets uniforms here, the, the classic Joe Namath uh, 1960s uh, uniforms, which, which had some great moments uh, with you in them. But, you know, as the decade went on, we had some, some pretty bad moments in those jerseys. You may have remembered the, the butt fumble and a few other plays. And so the Jets ended up changing uh, their uniforms. I wanted to get your thoughts on them. They did get panned at first, but a lot of people seem to have, have changed their mind on, on these uniforms. What, what is your opinion on the Jets' new uniforms? And as you may have seen, uh, quite a few – uh, NFL teams have been changing their look in the past few weeks. Yeah, I love them. I think they're fantastic. I, I wish I, you know, I wish I had uh, a version of that. I got to call up Gus over there, the, uh, the, uh, the trainer, and see if he can, uh, or the equipment manager, and see if he can get me set up with those. Those uniforms are sweet. Um, so, yeah, no, obviously, I, I love the ones where he had. I love representing the green and white. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be, you know, as a Jets fan, I'm not disappointed with these jerseys. I think, and especially the, the slick helmets. I mean, this this is the helmets really are cool. the best all part black. of it. Oh, and the all black, the black on black. I mean, that's that's nice. Or the dark, is it dark green. Black no, green. no, it's black. It, yeah, we we yeah. finally have an alternate jersey that we're proud of. I, I don't know if you remember having to play in those uh, Titans of New York uh, navy yeah. and gold throwbacks. I don't know what what your opinions on those uniforms were. 
It was nice to change it out, but you're right. I mean, they weren't the, they weren't the greatest jersey in the world. I, really I, re- like I actually the, remember watching the – I think the last game you guys wore them, uh, week two against Jacksonville in yeah, 2011. Uh, they're, the, one of the announcers brought up a quote that, uh, like, Rex Ryan really did not like them and said that they were pretty ugly. Was there, like, some uh, backlash – not backlash, but playfully uh, against those uniforms? Uh, that's a good question. I don't – I don't remember there being any. I remember we would always laugh with the white on white because white on white is not a great look for a big guy. For the guy. big guys. I, I've heard a few <laughs> other guys say that. Yeah, so Rex would always say, sorry about the white on white guys. But I don't remember much with the Titans jerseys. Is there any reason – this is, again, now that we're on the uniform subject, before we let you go, <laughs> is there any reason that, that the Jet – I mean, Rex clearly liked the, the white on white uniforms. They wore them pretty much every game in 20, 2009, 2010. But then when you guys got to the playoffs – you switched it up and wore the green pants. It worked against New England. Didn't have the same effect against Pittsburgh. Was there any reason that you recall that Rex was like, you know, let's not mess with luck here. Uh, let's switch it up. Because I guess you guys wore the all white against New England and got blown out by 42. So was there any sort of – how much does the coach have an input on, on the uniform? Oh, and he, he has all the input. And you know he's going to – he's picking it. So I, I'm not sure why Rex changed it up. I don't know if he even told us. But he certainly had a reason because uh, uh, when you – Especially in the playoffs, uh, pick, picking the color of the jerseys uh, is a big deal. You know, co- coaches think that, that that plays a role. Players think that plays a role. And so uh, I'm sure he had a reason for it. I'd be curious to see what it was. Well, Mike, um, it was, again, a very enjoyable experience to have you on. I know we went, we went pretty long, but, it, you know, I, I feel like I've just learned a lot just from hearing you talk about all these plays. And obviously it was a, a fun to get your thoughts on some of those highlights at the end. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day again to talk with us uh you know maybe in the future we'll do something like this again because it was it was really awesome and, and michael i don't know if you have any other words uh before we uh before we wrap this thing up yeah it's definitely well, it's, a lot of fun to have I, it's, it's funny because i don't know if you're talking to him or me but but i'll, I'll, I'll try it. to use michael for nania and then mike for the veto yeah, i just want to say too just thanks for coming on mike it was really fun to do this and it's just such a unique uh thing to do uh with this format to be able to look at all these clips and get your perspective uh, on these so thanks a ton for doing this oh of course guys thanks for having me on this was a lot of fun this was this was a really cool format so uh, uh i am definitely up to do this again whenever you guys want me all right well that that sounds good we'll uh we'll see what we have in store for the future again mike devito uh mike just really quickly shout out your twitter uh just so our, our fans can give you a follow because i'm sure after we tweet some of these videos out they'll, they might have some questions yeah of course it's mike devito 70 uh at twitter and so yeah that's where i'm at on social media i appreciate that guys all right, you heard it. Mike DeVito70 on Twitter. You can give him a follow. You can follow us as well at CYJ Pod on Twitter. Uh, we'll be tweeting out this episode and some clips from it. You can find the full episode at jetsxfactor.com. Uh, really excited about this one. Mike, thank you so much, man. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me.